future. Ramona Nicholas, just 35, has created a family business that has grown steadily over the past five years. With her husband, Canis, they set up Cara Pharmacies, a highly successful chain of chemists. Ramona will leave the comfort of her family life and home in South Donegal, and for the next eight days, she will live on her own in Galway, which is 92 euros. Under the guise of making a documentary on the New Ireland, Ramona will look for people and charities that she feels she can help. I feel like I want to give them everything that I have. And at the end of her journey, she will part with tens of thousands of euro as she reveals herself as the secret millionaire. At a young age, Ramona had achieved financial success through hard work and steady focus. My mother and father would have been really hard workers. My father, basically, he worked all day, come in, had his dinner at five o'clock and went out again. So there was always a strong work ethic in, in my background. And my mother was a teacher, so she would have taught and we would have come home. And But in saying that, there was no pushiness. Like, mum would still tell the story now where she used to take the light bulb out of the, the lampshades at night because I was studying for too long. She would have had enough and said, right, now it's time for bed. Two years ago, Carla Pharmacy bought its 11th shop. Hello. We set Carla Pharmacy up in 2002 and I went in and managed Donegal Town. So that was my first store. I was 24 at the time and Canis managed Bundorn. But we still had high hopes and high ambitions for what we wanted to do. It would seem so much more scary now than it did then. We just ploughed on, we knew what we wanted to do, we were going to work hard, we were going to make it work, and whatever had to be done had to be done, and that was it. Do you want to go through those people now? Yeah, sure. It is very much man's world from a career point of view. I can remember very clearly one day being asked by a colleague, another pharmacist, which one of Canis's shops did I work in? And <laughs> um, it made me drive myself further to, to actually work harder to get and it's not that you're, you're wanting recognition, you're not wanting recognition, it's just that suddenly people have realised now that there's two of us in the business. That's cool there. My favourite dad's Orlando Bloom, David yeah. Beckham. Money's important to the sense that I, I, you don't want to be worried about money. Um, that was my, my drive. Three years ago, while still growing the business at a crucial point, Ramona gave birth to her son, Alex. He had a kidney infection from birth and he got very, very ill when he was four months old and I blame myself for um, going back to work early and not seeing, not seeing it in him or not getting it checked early enough. And, um, oh, that tree's fixed. That tree's fixed. I never take him for granted how grateful and lucky we are to have a healthy, happy child. The material things in life don't really matter to your that much. Her comfort zone is her family and her friends and that's the part that's going to be difficult. It doesn't matter where she is, I don't think she's, she's going to be strong, she's going to do whatever, she sees the best in people. So that'll not be an issue. She's going to miss Alex number one. Is that a cup? Is that my breakfast? What I plan to do is actually leave a wee note for him every morning for Canis to read out to him so that he is conscious that you know I'm still about and that I'm coming back because I forget very easy. <laughs> You have to be a good wife, you have to be a good mother, you have to be a good career person, you have to be a good sister, you have to be a good daughter. And I think women have this thing in their heads that they have to be good at everything. You're a constant, it's a constant struggle to be that. I think if people talked more about the difficulties, I think things would be better for, for working mothers and for mothers that are at home. Before Ramona leaves her home, she invites some of her close friends and family for a final dinner and farewell. Cheers. Cheers. Outside her comfort zone. I don't think she's ever been in that type of an environment before and I remember her going on the holidays once and she stopped off in Bangkok for a few days and she didn't leave the hotel, you know? <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see how, um, how she manages. <laughs> All her best and her eight days away and hope that she enjoys it. The day of Ramona leaving home has arrived. My lifestyle now... Um, there's total naivety, wouldn't have a clue. And that's why I'm so excited about this, because for me it's going to be a huge challenge and 
I think for me it'll be life changing to see. I think I'd come back much more appreciative of what I have currently. All right, it'll be good for that, eh? Ramona is now leaving the comforts of home and family. Leaving Bundoran, she will take a bus south to Galway City, a place that holds special memories from the past. Galway's good because we actually have an affinity to Galway, so we would have went to Galway a lot before we got married, and after we got married before we had Alex, so I'm familiar with Galway, which is great. You're not from Galway, are you? Yeah. You don't know where St Bridges Place is or Prospect yeah. Hill? You need to go, say, go up to the other side of the square. Okay. Away from the bustling tourist centre of the city, Ramona heads for a house that will be her home for the next eight days. Sanitary conditions, <laughs> as my father calls them. It reminds me of a place we stayed in Belfast when I was a student. We had to put out salt for the slugs so they didn't come in the doors. Bleach and sort of that. Just once I get it cleaned, it'll be fine, I think. Only minutes after arriving in the house, a message from home starts to stir some emotions. How did you get that in there? <laughs> Be good and enjoy yourself. <laughs> the only thing I'm going to do. The only reason I feel emotion at the minute is because it's the reality of the fact that it's going to be the challenge is starting now, and I'm looking forward to this as much that I am. I'm not in shock or anything, it's just the reality of, of what it is like. Ramona now faces into her first day under the guise of presenting a documentary called Generations. She will try and find people or groups that she can help. It's just very real for me when I come in through the door. It was just, it was, it was buying. This is it. We're here now, and for that split second, I just felt overwhelmed, and I just thought, okay, I'm, I'm not at home anymore. This, this is real now, and this isn't my life. And I just have to make the most of it. Whereas today, I'm totally at home with that, and I'm totally in, in terms of that. I've spent, you know, this morning reflecting on that. Leafing through the Connacht Tribune, Ramona comes across an article of interest. Galway Autism Partnership is hosting another sensory friendly movie club for children associated by autism spectrum disorders. That's the first time that I have stayed on my own in, in a very long time and I felt probably more secure here than I would have felt in my own house. As soon as I went to bed I was sleeping within 15 minutes so I feel a lot more energised today. Galway is a thriving city that boasts tourism, a string of festivals and acts as a gateway to the west of Ireland. However, the city also has its own problems. Underlying the obvious images of Galway, there is a strong prevalence of homelessness and the problems associated with alcohol. And with this in mind, Ramona decides to pay a visit to the city library to find some more information through local press articles. An urgent appeal has been made by the Galway City Homelessness Forum for a generous individual or group to provide premises in the city which could provide shelter to homeless people in the city this winter. The appeal is being spearheaded by Galway COPE. So COPE currently accommodate up to 40 people in emergency accommodation every night of the year. 
men at the Fairgreen Hostel and women at the Osterley Lodge. Leaving the library, Ramona notices a poster for the Galway Autism Partnership, a group she read about in the paper earlier that morning. After reading the article about COPE, Ramona has arranged a visit to the Fairgreen Hostel, Galway's only homeless shelter for men. Just a stone's throw from Air Square, she meets COPE worker Donna, who has been working with the charity for 17 years. How many beds have you all together in the... uh, 26 single rooms. Okay. We don't have dormitories in here. And they all occupied? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. We work at about an, um, between a 97% and a 99% capacity all the time, which means that we're almost always full. Okay. They, they obviously, they're allowed to bring their, their alcohol and their... No, no, no alcohol or drugs allowed in the building. If you bring alcohol into a building, it, it changes the whole dynamic. So people are allowed in with alcohol taken. Okay, but not but to bring it into the building. No, it's too much of a risk. So can you show me one of the rooms then? Yeah. Okay, this is one of the empty rooms. Okay. So this is about average. The average okay. size. This little room almost becomes a tiny little home for them. Yeah, it's their own little space. So it's always a difficulty to find the balance between making place nice and comfortable and um, respectful to the person's needs mm -hmm. as it should be. And they're not making it too comfy yeah. because you don't want people to become um, institutionalised or, de in, or dependent, dependent on it, yeah. I'd say that's really hard. It is. Your natural, your natural instinct is to care. Sure. But I can't get my head around it, so it just doesn't make sense to me as you're saying that this is a sober room. Mm -hmm. How does that whole element work if they come in under the influence? It's all done by level of risk. Okay. So we're all trained in various techniques. So if we don't know a person and they arrive at the gate and they obviously have alcohol and or drugs taken, yeah. we might chat with them at the gate for a while to ascertain what their mood is like. Yes. So if they get cranky or up fairly quickly into the conversation, we can ascertain, okay, this person may need to sober up and come back later, yeah. or they may be just agitated right now and they need to go away for a little while. So we explain to, to, to residents why. It's not a punitive control issue. It's trying to maintain health and safety for everybody in the building. And nine times out of 10 people understand, um, but you will get people in addiction who will yeah. bring stuff in. On the notice board in Fairgreen, Ramona reads a leaflet about a charity that encourages the homeless to take up running. See the on the road again? Yeah. Do you know anything about that? Sure. Um, a man called uh, Paul Fallon right. came up with the idea and approached the organisation. Um, he's developed this like, fitness program idea around people who are experiencing homelessness. And then I think at the beginning of this year, I think he raced across Ireland uh, to raise awareness and to raise some money. Himself. Yeah, he's been extremely dedicated and it's extremely popular. Later that day, Ramona sits down to her first meal in her new home. This afternoon going to Fairgreen Hostel, you know, the work that the girls are doing there for me is bravery. It takes a particular type of person to be able to do that. I don't. I don't think I would have the the ability to do what those ladies are doing and, and to be able to leave it behind. It's a massive eye opener for me, and I need to consider where I feel I can make the difference. And I'm constantly thinking in my own head, even not in monetary terms. If there's some difference that I can make through some other aspect, not necessarily money wise. Ramona Nicholas is a successful businesswoman. She is living undercover in Galway City on a secret search for people to help. After living there for eight days, she will give away thousands of euro, revealing herself to be the secret millionaire. The previous day, Ramona visited the Fairgreen Hostel, a charity that provides the basic needs for the homeless and those in the throes of addiction. Today, she is going to one of the country's most unique treatment centres for addiction. Coomvira is Ireland's only detox programme for addicts of alcohol. Since 1966, the centre has treated over 75,000 people. The success of the house relies on people who have gone through the programme to work as volunteers. Ramona meets Frank, one of those volunteers. 
This is where they're initially checked out. Okay. And they're uh, assessed in here. And uh, then they're given a bed. Uh -huh. And if they're still in detox, they're given a the pyjama so they can keep an eye on home. Who goes yeah, on medication yeah, yeah, so yeah. they can keep an eye on them for the first few days. That's the public phone. It's the only one to have. So they don't come in with any mobiles or anything? The mobiles are taken off them. Right. Yeah, we try and leave the outside world outside. And what is the logic behind making the break from the outside world? It's to help them deal with themselves, to stop the head racing, to, to, to understand that they have to get themselves well first. before they can Think about anything do else anything else. else. Okay. A lot of people come in here with relatives or husband, wife or mother yeah. or father and we advise them to try and leave them for a couple of days okay, and not and be ringing the hall, let them okay. settle. There's people that come in that don't have any phone calls to make maybe? Yeah, Is there? yeah, yeah, yeah. They come totally on their own and find it very hard to cope with visitors coming here, the phone ringing. This is why it's restricted as well. Because, because it can they, affect people that don't have that any. don't have any yeah. outside contact. In here, when they come through the gates, it's their last hope. And they're full of anger and they can be full of resentments. And you have to, step. yeah, you have to, you know, that you've been there yourself and yeah. this program does work, give it a chance. The fact that you've done it yourself and been through it makes yeah. a Yeah, and I can identify with them. From the age of 10, Frank had started to drink, and at 17, he joined the army. About a year into my army career, uh, I went to Lebanon. Yes. When I was 18, I was in the Lebanon. When I'd done six months out there, when I came back, that's when things took, took a turn for the worst. Okay. Uh, a lot of fear came back into my life, and uh, the only way I knew to quench that was... Drink. Yeah, to drink. They felt like they had to put me away somewhere. Yeah. So they put me into... Uh, uh, psychiatric hospital in, in Mullingar. Right. Uh, St. Lomans, Mullingar. Okay. It was a hard place to be at 19. And when I came out there after the six weeks, they gave me a medical discharge out of the army. Okay. So I went on the road again. Uh, I met up with uh, people from the travelling community. Right. And I lived with them for three years, travelling in different countries. So when I was 26, I got married. And I married an alcoholic. We thought it was a great idea for a party. I knew her six days and we yeah. got married. So that's... Do you knew her six days when you got yeah, married? Yeah, got married. She had the car, she had the house. I had nothing. That was going great, but we were drinking in the house and she fell pregnant. And uh, I have a beautiful son now, he's 22. But uh, when he was five, she passed away. You know, uh, drink killed her. And uh, I didn't even go to the funeral. Uh, I blamed her. For oh, leaving me, for causing all this in my life, you know. So it was an excuse, as I know now, for me to be comfortable in me drinking. Mm. You know, people said, "Ah, oh, sure, look, he's, you know, that's why he's the way he is." I need a drink to to get up in the morning. I need a drink to open the front door, to drive, uh, to work. Yeah, it just took over my whole life. I needed to function. I got through every day. I didn't want to go through every day that makes sense. I'd go to sleep and not want to wake up and be annoyed when I do wake up. Be annoyed? Annoyed. I have to go through the same thing again. So it's a very dark place to be. Yeah. But, um... Frank has invited Ramona to attend a group meeting taking place within the centre. I thought today what we'd talk about, or what I'd ask you, is your experiences of Coonvera. Why did you come to Coonvera, and why do you still feel the need to be here? I had lost everything um, through alcohol, through drink, drugs. Four months ago, I was in the gutter, and I was in a bad, bad way mentally, physically. I was. I'm so happy today. It's absolute. This place is just brilliant. I come back here to give back what I got from the house, which is my self confidence, my self worth, and that I belong, you know, in a place like this to help others recover because it's such a deadly illness to have, you know. I just never left. You know, and the family know I'm here and they know I'm safe. And that's the way I look at it, really, you know. I don't know what the reason is that. Keeps me here, but something keeps me here. Yeah. But I just can't put my finger on it, you know. 
I never belonged anywhere. And finally, I now I do belong here. I belong here. And I, say, I, I do treat this as my home. I didn't want to live before I came here. I didn't want to live. Uh, but when I came here, my life has grown and grown. And it's true to people in this house. If anyone wants to say to me, who is your family? I'd say, come where is my family? When you told me this morning where I was going, I had wrote it off. Didn't feel positive about it in comparison even to yesterday. And um, then I met Frank and I think when I sat down and started listening to Frank's story and Frank's journey and when he said that he wanted to take his own life several times, I understood and I, I had never understood before. And you know, here to me it's, it's still, it's, it's grim, but they're also positive and and I can see how everything, how everybody, today I've developed a sympathy that I didn't ever have before and for me that's been massive. I feel like I want to give them, you know, everything that I have. After an emotional day, the following morning, Ramona continues on her search for people and charities. She is curious about the leaflet she read about on the road again. She heads to Galway University running track to meet its founder, Paul Fallon. Paul returned from a job at America four years ago to set up a charity that he believes can have a huge impact on mental health and the lives of the homeless. Oh, hey, there you go. Ronnie, you're next. <laughs> I started on the road again last year, January 2011, after volunteering for COP the previous year. We did an eight-week program for a couple of their clients, okay. and I saw the results that was achieved by one of their clients. It's a lad that's actually training with us here now, Ronnie. Okay. Um, after the eight weeks, his personal circumstances really improved. His self-esteem and self-confidence mm. increased just by doing the running three mornings a week. Mm. So Coop asked me to say, could I do the program again for them in okay. 2011? And I said, well, I may as well extend it across all the agencies yeah. in uh, the city in Galway. Yeah. And because there's a big crossover with people suffering from uh, homelessness and mental health issues mm. like anxiety, depression, I decided to include mental health groups in it as well. Okay. It's very well documented, like your releases, endorphins, yeah. all that kind of stuff, you know. And running and walking in particular is kind of a slow release and that kind of feel-good factor mm. stays with you. Okay. Do you mind if I join on? <laughs> yeah, if you feel up to it, no problem at all, yeah. We'll try to take it easy on you. Yeah, I don't want to do any hurdles. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fun of it. Mark, set, go. Come on, Mark. All right. Oh. You I, go I, should, I should go on the inside, take the short You want to go on the inside? <laughs> there you go, go on. No, you're not right, I'm joking. There's different levels, like I was saying. So yeah. the likes of, say, coffee, Mike, Mike, what the head. They're like, say, they're going to They're training, they're they're training, training for, for, they're for training marathon, for the double right? marathon. They're wow. in the tank day last week, last Thursday. Okay. In like 47 minutes. And uh, like at the moment, I'm still a volunteer. Yeah. I'm, I'm still unemployed, you know. I'm doing this, like, say, the last couple of years, you know. So I think to make it more stable, we do need to say, you know, full-time staff members to push it forward and all that kind of stuff, you know. Ramona talks to Ronnie and Mike, both participants in the programme. Paul's doing a great job. He was on his own in the office, like, and he was trying to do it. And mm. Then he's chasing the guys that's not turning up. Like, yeah, um, he, he spoke about that, about it being really rewarding and yet really frustrating about the fact that people can continue and then suddenly off the wagon and back on yeah, again and back and it, forward. Like, but, well, like, if you just keep at it. Mm. You know, it's confidence building as well, so it yeah, is, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot of people here that have come from different backgrounds and yeah, so of course, on, and, yeah. and through addiction issues as well, like, you know, yeah. the confidence is, is a big thing, like, mm. you know. We were at a Conwara and we had a very positive experience there. Um, you were there yourself? I was there myself, yeah, I went in there in uh, July 2008. Okay. Um, I suppose uh, drinking, and, uh, drinking and drugging, like, it was, got too much for me and I went to my GP back, yes. back down home and, and he, uh, he sent me to, to Coomera. Okay. I found, How did you find it? I found it very good. When okay. I when I got there, like you know, I was, I was well looked after. I sent into a detox unit for ten yeah. days, yeah. and then we started a, a program. Then you know, and I found it very beneficial. Everyone in there looked after each other, like you know. Yeah, it was like a family unit. It's, it's like a family unit. Mm. It's it's all about trying, like you know, mm. and I haven't the want, mm. which I haven't lost yet. Good. Today, so Paul, thanks, million. No problem. Thanks very much. Okay. All right, guys, we'll just do one more lap, all right? All right. Good luck. Cheers. See you later. Cheers, guys. Bye. Easy.
Galway is among the worst areas of Ireland receiving support services for autism. Ramona wants to find out more about the Galway Autism Partnership after seeing the group's leaflet in the library earlier that week. What started out as a Facebook page is now in the early days of becoming a full-time charity. She's arranged a meeting with the women who got it all started. I have two children, Jack and Layla, and Jack is nearly, um, he's five and a half. Mm -hmm. He was diagnosed when he was uh, three. Okay. His preschool teacher had said to me, um, you know, how is his speech at home? I'm a bit concerned here. Yeah. It, that conversation is crystallized in my mind and in my heart forever because I just remember just this stabbing feeling going, A fear. oh no, because it had been niggling at me for so yeah. long. With Dylan and with John, I mean, they're perfect in so many other ways. I mean, they're they're quite loving little boys. You know, I mean, last last year, Dylan is seven and a half, he'd be eight this year. And he said, I love you to me for the first time. Oh, and I nearly burst into tears. And, uh, <laughs> he eats inedible objects. He eats candles. He eats... Okay. He's he obsessed with, like, bottles of deodorant, stuff like that, because okay. he always wants to be shaking them and feeling them. Yeah. We have no interest in toys. Toys don't exist. Yeah, you know, so they don't exist for him. Once Jack got his diagnosis, I remember, you know, sitting in the office with the psychologist and asking, well, you know, where do I go now? Is there, you know, is there a support group? Can I meet other parents? You know, what's out there for me? And she was kind of just shaking her head going, well... Yeah, you know, we'll see if we can organise some speech and language therapy or something. But there was literally nothing. nothing. So you just, you know, you're plummeting into this big void. That's where I think that the gap comes into it because parent to parent support, you can't replace it because even mm -hmm. while all our children are completely different, we all have had similar experiences, experiences in lots yeah, of different yeah. areas and lots of different difficulties. That, that's yeah. one of the positive things that have come out of that yeah. is the fact that we're not sitting here giving out about the fact, oh my no, God, there's not. And all of the families in GAP, it, you know, it's not just the committee. Yeah. Everybody makes an effort. Lee, why are you operating out, out of at the minute or what? what? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, at the moment, we're... Kitchens. <laughs> Kitchens. Kitchens. Right, Kitchens. Okay. We launched our organisation on the 2nd of April okay. and we lit up Hotel Merrick in, in blue. It was part of our awareness campaign. It was also World Autism. Awareness Day. And is that blue is the colour of autism. Sorted. You know, we're celebrating autism. Yeah. You know, we're not mourning for the children that we don't have. We're celebrating the children that we do have. Yeah. The women have invited Ramona to attend a picnic for families with autism the following day. It will offer her a chance to meet the families and children in person. A Friday night in Galway, Ramona takes to the streets to get a picture of the city at night. She is now halfway through her time in Galway and Ramona reflects on the experience to date. I am completely shocked at the number of people out there working. Like I think I go to, go to work every day and I'm doing a great job. You know, you have good days and your bad days, but Jesus man, what those people are doing in those charities is... What I'm doing is a piece of piss compared to what they're doing. That's, that's the way I felt. It, it, every single one that I went to, I felt the same about. Ramona Nicholas has been living undercover in Galway for almost a week. Her cover is that she is presenting a series on how life has changed in Ireland. In truth, she is looking for people that she can help. In a few days, she will be donating tens of thousands of euro of her own money. One of the problems facing families with autism is a sense of social exclusion. For that reason, the Galway Autism Partnership organised family days on a monthly basis. Well, this is your double. <laughs> Mini me. <laughs> Jack is there. Hi, Jack. It's great that the other kids interact. See the likes of Emily there and Matthew have been able to interact. Yeah. Adele's older two are fantastic. They're so protective yeah. as well. I can see that, ones. Yeah. You know, They're always watching out as John goes yeah. to do a runner yeah. and, you know, ready to go and grab him. Genetically, there is a much higher chance of having um, a sibling if, if right. you already have a diagnosis in the okay. family. And... Um, Often, if you look back through the generations as well, you might be able to see sort of autism traits. You, you want like to ride on the horse? Girl, here we are. Up you go. Dylan, do you want to go on the pony? You find this good? 
fantastic. Majority of the children would suffer from what they call sensory processing disorder. Some of the children can be undersensitive, oversensitive, or they can be a combination. It's not an intellectual disability, it's actually a biological disorder yeah. of your brain. But some of the children would have a dual diagnosis of maybe a learning disability or intellectual disability yeah, as, well. as well. Yeah, you know, so it's very complicated. Where have you been getting the funding from up to date then? And how We've that been working? really, I suppose, trying to fundraise ourselves. We had a bucket collection the day of the Lighted Up Blue, the day of our yeah. official launch, um, going around the streets shaking our buckets, shouting for yeah. Goliath as an partnership. Then uh, last January, I tried to bribe Lee and Louise to say, will we start training and will we do the mini marathon? Yeah, in June. So, in June. So actually, there ended up being eight mums ended up doing the mini marathon. Would you like a balloon? Good to see you. How are you? How do you find days like this work for you, Maria? I like here. I okay. like here. I really pick and choose my places. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Why? Oh yeah, definitely. Big don't work. Some don't work for you. Some don't work. There's only so much anxiety I can take on in and outing. Yeah. There's no hidden corners within reason. Yeah. It's very, very safe. Mm. Nobody is judged here. You don't have to yeah, worry about that's the very obvious, Yeah. You don't have to worry about that because we're all in the same boat. Yeah. Everybody's. <laughs> you know. At the same even though that doesn't hugely bother me. Still in all, you know, it can affect different people. You'd be people. amazed. You think mm. people are educated on mm. autism and the behaviours of it and that, but no, sure, um, myself wouldn't have had. They're not really, no. I just want to tell her story. I just felt, you know, there's still it's a huge stigma attached. She just she can't go out with other people, like still. Even though they're happy and the children are happy, it's not a normal life. I suppose just, as I'm with Alex today, it just, I don't know. I just don't think I could be that positive about it, like. Every one of those parents in there are no different from me or no different from Candice and I just think it's sad that they all have to, they have no support network. They've had to do all this themselves, not by choice. And the lack of services out there is just mad, really. They have no money, they don't have any money. It takes nine grand to train a dog, like. Today we've re revisited GAP and it was my first real interaction with children that suffered on the autism spectrum so uh, before I'd met the mothers and I'd seen everything from their perspective but now I've seen the families, the whole bigger picture which I hadn't seen before. It doesn't just affect one person, it affects a whole family, a whole family unit and you can see that and I'm beginning to see it on our second visits with, with each of the charities. It's been a lifetime experience to me. I don't think I'll ever see, even just last night when we were out, it was unseeing what's on the streets, like it's shocking. We were at film and shooting on, in, in the city centre and we met several of the clients that would go to for a green hostel. And um, I felt fearful. So it, it was when I came home and I was thinking through things, I was very clear that um, I, I can't help those people because I'm not in a position to be able to make a difference because you have to want to help yourself first and those people clearly aren't in that position yet. After sleeping on it overnight, Ramona is worried that she hasn't properly seen the range of work done by Cope Galway. She remembers Donna mentioning a service for women that is run by a charity. Ramona tries to make contact with the woman's refuge, dealing with domestic violence on Waterside. I've just been on the on the phone to Wendy from Waterside. There is a girl there called Mary who has agreed to speak to me and um, to give me a little bit of her background. So we're going to go up there and have a chat with her, see how she reacts, but she won't go on camera. So we'll see how it goes. About three years ago, I came to stay in the refuge. Over a period of about a year and a half, I would have stayed about six times in total. Okay. Um, just the relationship I was in was quite abusive and controlling. Okay. Even after the six times of being here, I, I never left the relationship. 
Okay. It was about a month after the last time I was here that I finally did make the move. Okay. Which is two years ago now, so. Why did you feel it was important to stay in the relationship even though? You get so strong from being in here and being supported and all the information that you leave here thinking that, you know, they want to change. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess at the end you finally realise that they won't, but you can't put a timeline on that, you know, it has to run its course. I could see her as somebody that I would be out socialising with. I can't even understand how to get into to her mind or, or what, how the trauma, and she now is behaving and acting and leading a very normal life, and it's not that long ago, two years, um, and to go back and forward six times is, uh, I don't know, you know, what, what she must have suffered during that period of time before she even came here. Wendy, the centre's manager, shows Ramona around the modest facilities within Waterside. Um, as you can see, there's a bunk bed and a single bed. Uh, it's quite basic. Uh, this is the only 24-hour refuge yeah, in the Western it's, region. Uh, we, we would cover Galway City and County, but we would also take referrals from other areas. Okay. So it would often be the case that we would be on the phone to the, to the refuge in Limerick looking for a place for a woman, and they might be on the other line to us looking for a place for somebody there. So refuges are under a lot of pressure in terms of spaces for women. We would be able to accommodate six women and up to 15 children when, when we're at full occupancy, which is most of the time, unfortunately. Yeah, because that doesn't seem like an awful lot. Well, uh, we never turn women away. I think it's really important to say that, and I don't think any refuge does. If it's late at night, we will take families in anyway. This couch we're sitting on is, yeah, is actually a pull-out bed and has been used over 30 times last year. These are all very familiar to me. <laughs> All very normal things. Children are often either present in a room or in the next room when domestic violence is happening. So that's a really important thing to know about children when they come. Yeah. Uh, they will be experiencing their own uh, trauma around that and their own issues around that. I looked over there and I seen like that side of cars and I think, Christ of Almighty. You know, if you're ever in a situation where you felt like you had a, I, I don't know, I think I would sit and cry and cry and cry and cry for days, think that, but to come down and to actually be brave enough to put your finger on the door, lift the phone and make the call. And it's so important that that person who answers the door is the right person because if she met the wrong person at the door, she could have very easily turned her heels and walked back to what was her future or could have been her future. Do you see a situation where a lot of the women would, would be repetitive? Mm. Absolutely. I mean, I think most refuges would have a readmission rate of, of around 40 to 50 percent, and that would be okay. quite normal. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to say, you know, that uh, we would see that as a success for women, that yeah. they're coming in, they're accessing safety for themselves and their children at a time when they need it. Mm -hmm. They may not. We know already that leaving a relationship is a process. It's not a once-off event. Mm -hmm. um, so that takes time. It's the same as anybody leaving any relationship. You don't just walk out. You try and make it work. You do all the things that you, you think you should be doing. Mm. You might blame yourself and so mm. on. So if you add in domestic violence to that scenario, you know, it, it's obviously the same, but it's different. When Ramona last met Paul Fallon, it was on the running track. She was impressed by his get up and go attitude, but Ramona wants to meet Paul at home to try and get a better idea about the man behind the charity. What's the drive from your point of view? You know, I'm 47 years old and I think I finally found something that I really like doing that I'm really good at. Like, you know, I had high paying jobs in America and all that kind of stuff. Like, but you know, it doesn't, but yeah. it doesn't compare to, say, what I'm doing now. Has it been days where you felt like giving up, you know, or, or do you feel that yeah. that's not a possibility? No, I, well, I don't feel it's a possibility, but in December, I ran a thousand miles around Ireland to try you and did, raise yeah. awareness for the programme and try to raise funds for the programme. And that was very difficult. One second, sorry. You're all right, you're all right. You can, you can cut this bit out. You're all right. Uh, I, I understood as well that we're like a uh, very small fish in a big pond as regards mm. say charities. We're, we're, we're very new. And, uh, but it was very frustrating in that point of view. And from my own personal point of view, like I said, you, you know, just really trying to make ends meet, which is very, very difficult. You know, the, the kids are very small, you know what I mean? And just trying to pay bills and put food on the table mm. and pay rent and all that kind of stuff. And you question yourself, am I doing the right thing? The main thing is now, say, if we, we can get some, some kind of funding or, you know, just try and figure out what are we going to be doing, for, you know, for, you know, like this term will end in September. So I think we're coming to a crossroads. When Ramona first visited Coonvira, 
she came with some preconceived notions. That shortly changed after meeting volunteer Frank. However, Ramona still has some questions. She goes to meet the gardener Liam, who she last saw at the group meeting. It's warm in here, Liam. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry to hate now in here. So Liam, how long are you here yourself? Came to do a program. A few years ago, I stayed. It's hard out in the real. It is. World. It's hard in the real world, but sometimes people think this is not real. This can be real enough in here as well. Tell you. Oh. Way. But uh, you see them coming in in our first week, John. Don't know where they are. They don't want to, wouldn't know what end of them's up or anything else. And then steadily as the weeks go on, they come down to me and I can see them changing. Yes. You know, it's good to see them coming. Yeah. Right to themselves now they're down in the yeah. gardens yeah. or out in the flower beds or something. Yeah. Kilmer is unique, really. It, uh, when you take up to 80 people all here with the whole addiction, yes. and, uh, there's never a word and it's all gel together. Yeah, it's all very, you can see it's all, everybody's very you know positive. I mean? like, there's never a bad word, really. They're an early sport, you see. They were planted later. Yeah. It gives you a sense of what. Yes, you know what I mean? that you wouldn't have had self-worth before. you wouldn't before. have, like, because when you're drinking, you don't care about your family, you don't care... You know, the only thing you think about mm. is, is drinking. Drink. And yeah. it turns out to be your best friend. Yeah. So when you lose that friend, like, it takes a long time to... To regenerate. Yeah, right with them. Oh, the lettuces are lovely. Yeah, that's the Wow. Did you, you wouldn't get friggin' lettuces that got in the shop? No. Pull one now for yourself. Pull one. Go on, take one with you. Do you feel that a lot of people here including yourself would, would feel that like is a, a little bit of a safety net and there's no judgment whereas there is more so in the outside world a lot of people that come back here would come back that know that this uh, this house can't work without people like myself coming yeah. back yeah. because they're on such a low budget okay and you're you're taught that um you can't keep it you have to give it on okay that's how much you have but yes. it's mostly for the the, the passion of life you'd have now Mm -hmm. and the peace of mind you'd have, you'd like to try and give it to somebody else. And do you think it's difficult, you know, from a trust point of view for the families if once the addict has recovered and they move out back into the real world? I would have heard all these promises, these false promises we call them now, already, like, I'll stop tomorrow, I won't do it anymore. Yeah. And then the family have a huge issue in, um, if you do 12 weeks in here, you're yes. cured. Yes, you know, they think that's it, That's done. it, done. Yeah. Yeah. But then when they come in themselves for their own meetings, they quickly understand that the addiction has been there, treated for life. Yeah, yeah. And it's about trust on both sides. One-to-one -one counselling helps a lot. And if it can be worked out... And when you, see, the, when you see those counsellors, that's something you feel that you'd be good at yourself? I'd love to be stuck in the middle of it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Sometimes I can be like a mother hen. Yeah. And I have to step back. Yeah. You know, I yeah. feel like, oh, well, I can, you know. Yeah, you can help, yeah. But they have to stand on their own two feet. Yeah. And because that's a bad world out there, mm. outside them gets. What is? Yeah. In terms of yourself, you're starting to learn again? Yeah. Okay. I want to learn, to mm -hmm. read and write. Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to read a book, which is, doesn't sound much, but. No, it's huge. It's yeah. huge. Yeah. I, I do hear people talking about these experiences of books and things, and I just yeah. can't. Yeah. You know, so it'd be great to open the world to me that way. Yeah. It's the end of Ramona's stay in Galway. After a long and busy week, she has some difficult decisions to make. Tomorrow, Ramona will give away thousands of euro of her own money. My head's all over the place, to be perfectly honest. Yesterday, I was very sure of what I wanted to do. Um, today, I'm going to have to take time out and reflect. I want to think about it logically in terms of how I can make a difference and how my contribution will actually make uh, lives better for those people that are in there at the place that I visited. Now at this particular time I'm envisaging speaking to the person that I'm going to make the difference to and I'm so looking forward to that and the reaction. I feel it's really interesting that no one has asked any questions and nobody has asked anything really about me which is great, it's made my job really easy. Um, the difficult job now really is deciding what direction I'm going to go in. After a sleepless night, Ramona has made her choice on the people she wants to help. She has told them that she wants to film a final goodbye, but in reality, she is about to donate thousands of euro towards their causes. The amount of what has been difficult as well to decide what, who to give what to. What I've tried to do is try to make my decision based on who I think 
the funds will make the biggest difference to short and long term. Ramona's first visit is to the women behind the Galway Autism Partnership, a group that has impressed her from the start of her journey. Thanks girls for, for meeting up with me, it's been a whole big experience for me. Um, I have learnt an awful mm. lot. Mm. How did you feel yourselves? Part of our goals are, are to, you know, to try and raise awareness of autism. Yeah. You know, the spectrum is so broad and so yeah. varied. You know, just we want a little bit more public understanding, I suppose, yeah. of the condition. Well, I haven't been entirely honest with you. Um, this is not my scene at all. Um, I manage shops um, oh. all day, every day. So, really? Yeah. <laughs> shocked at what you're saying. <laughs> okay, so the bottom line is, anyway, I have decided that I'd like to make a donation to you um, in the hope that you can use oh it. My <laughs> oh, wow. towards, oh my god. Towards um, building the, the, the whole charity. I feel personally very connected to the charity. Thank you so and, much. And um, we'll Thank be. you very much. I don't think oh we can gosh. say it. <laughs> Totally, I'm speechless. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> speechless for once. I wasn't. I had, I had no idea that that was coming. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, you're the best. Thank you. I, th I think they're in shock. I I've made the right decision. It's gone to the right place, and I do think they'll use it. They're smart. They'll use it wisely. Ramona returns to Waterside. On her last visit, she had talked to Mary, but was deeply moved by the children's story within domestic violence. However, Ramona's emotions start to get the better of her as she meets um. Wendy. Wendy, we haven't been entirely honest with you. Mm -hmm. I've been looking at different charities in Galway. Mm. Um, myself and my husband run a relatively successful company, mm. um, which means that I'm in the position. Don't forget that. What, what, is, what is this, Rona? It's a check. That's absolutely wonderful. Really, really appreciate that, Ramona. No Thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm totally taken aback. Yeah, These poor children really need something. They're coming in, maybe the mother has fled during the night, they don't have nappies, they don't have food, they don't have anything. And that was why I decided. Oh, Thank so you. mean. <laughs> <laughs> something like this is a huge validation, I think, for, for the women who are experiencing this and the children, um, because it lets the world know that this is actually going on. Even in 2012, it's still happening. Ramona visits Paul for the last time. What's your expectations from the documentary? Have you yourself gotten uh, the awareness out there? What have you thought? Hopefully we'll get a, a, a lot of uh, publicity about it. You know, that a lot of people know. And uh, if we can get some kind of assistance from business people that are out there, mm -hmm. uh, financial assistance is always great, definitely. Well, I have some good news for you. Yeah. We're not filming a documentary. Okay. Basically, I am a pharmacist okay. and I run a company called Cara Pharmacy yeah. with my husband, mm -hmm. which is relatively successful, okay. um, which means I've been given a fantastic opportunity of being able to travel um, around several different charities in, in Galway. Yeah. Um, I felt overwhelmed by the level of commitment that you have given yeah. personally, Paul, and I'm in a position to give this to you, personally. Well. <laughs> uh, thank you so, so much. I can't even uh, put into words. <laughs> this means so much, it really does, you know. It's like, I've always uh, thought that if you keep trying, you know, uh, there's good people out there and people will know about us and we can, you know, move forward. It's great. Thank you for it. Oh my god. There have been a bunch of liars all along. Did you ever hear of a show called The Secret Millionaire? I feel it's a real positive thing for him and it'll give him the motivation and it will spur him on to continue doing what he's doing because he loves what he's doing and I think he's taking a lot of knocks. I think they're in shock, as everybody has been that we've, we've met. Ramona has one final farewell. I come in with a, an extremely negative attitude, which I spoke to you about. I felt I bonded with you straight away. I felt that I understood for the first time what it must be like, um, instead of having a really bad attitude about the whole thing. I haven't been totally honest with you, Frank, okay? The show that we're filming is called The, the, the Secret Millionaire. 
Okay, which means that I'm in a position to make a donation, mainly because of you, to Kunwara. That's fantastic. I wouldn't have... Uh, that's fantastic. Um, you know, to... to cry now. Um, <laughs> thanks a million. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That will help so many people. You've helped me so much too. Not just with this for the house, but you really listened to me. And you felt my pain. You felt where I was. That was fantastic. It's a great relief for me too. That's great. I think the fact that I listened to him and it's very hard for Alex to be listened to and it's, he has a sad story behind him. I do think it will have a, a major impact on him. It'll give him a wee bit of confidence to spur him on, maybe to do the literacy classes, maybe to become a counsellor, do whatever he has to do to, to get better in himself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're brilliant. You're a good person. If somebody had said to me a week before I started in this journey that that's what I was going to end up doing, I'd laughed at them and told them to catch themselves on. I feel I've gone through life with blinkers on very narrow-minded, just tunnel vision, my world end off. I feel I've been given a wonderful opportunity to see so many different areas, walks of life that I never would have been given that chance to do so before. I feel things that I may have been concerned or worried or stressed about before only minor comparative to what some of the people that we've met are going through. And I just realise that what I do every day is simple and the life I'm leading is so different to those people that we've seen over the journey.